Ja, bevor ich das Wort gleich an Henning Engelke äh, übergebe, der dann den Referenten des heutigen Abends vorstellt, David James, wo wir uns sehr freuen, dass er heute hier ist, natürlich noch wieder zwei, drei Hinweise auch zu der Veranstaltung und der Kopie. Ähm, wir haben heute eine Kopie, die per se ein lautes Brummen mit sich hat, ähm, mit sich trägt. Und wir haben alles versucht, es, es äh, leise zu machen, bis wir erfahren haben, dass es auf jeden Fall von der Aufnahme selbst stammt. <lacht> Darauf wird David James auch noch nachher eingehen. Ähm, da bitte also nicht sich gestört fühlen. Das ist tatsächlich die bestmögliche Variante, die von diesem Film vorliegt, die uns das MoMA geschickt hat. Wir machen äh, wie immer eine Pause nach der Lecture. Ähm, das Filmcafé hat geöffnet bis 21.30 Uhr. Äh, danach hat es geschlossen. Das heißt, Sie können in der Pause dann auch nochmal Getränke holen. Ähm, ich soll wieder darauf hinweisen, dass Sie nicht die Notausgänge zum Rauchen verwenden sollen, ähm, da das ein Problem bei uns im Haus auslöst. <lacht> Also bitte dann einfach hochgehen äh, zum Haupteingang und dort dann rauchen wir. Durch den Gong signalisieren wir, wenn es dann weitergeht. Genau. Ähm, und natürlich auch noch ein Hinweis, der noch nicht angekündigt war und der vielleicht für regelmäßige Besucher dieser Reihe interessant ist. Wir haben äh, beschlossen, dass wir eine Abschlussdiskussion zusätzlich machen werden. Und zwar äh, eine Woche nach der letzten Lecture, am Donnerstag, den 17. Juli, ähm, wo dann die vier Organisatoren... Regine Prange, Henning Engelke, Vincent Hediger und Marc Siegel gemeinsam hier vorne sitzen werden in einer Podiumsdiskussion und nochmal darüber diskutieren, was denn jetzt nun die Ergebnisse von Easier Than Painting sind. Und ja, das äh, können Sie sich schon mal vormerken, das wird mit Sicherheit eine spannende Runde und jetzt übergebe ich das Wort an Henning Engelke. Schönen Abend. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce David James. David is a professor in the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. He was trained in English lit literature and his first book in 1977 was on William Blake. Since then, his research has expanded to include cinema and popular culture. He is also a published poet and a filmmaker. The reason why he is here tonight is that he is one of the leading scholars on American alternative cinemas. His 1989 book, Allegories of Cinema, American Film in the 60s, literally reframed the field of experimental film studies. Not only does it place experimental films within a wider context of alternative as well as commercial film practices, political documentary, feminist film, black cinemas, Hollywood in transition and the porn industry, It also consequently views alternative film practices as part of social and political histories, transcending the gridlocked debates of the 1970s and 1980s between formalist aesthetic and political activism. I should also mention that the book still holds as absolutely fascinating reading. David James has published widely on histories and theories of popular culture, film and class struggle, East Asian cinemas, the cultural geographies of California, particularly Los Angeles, and a subject he initially considered for tonight's lecture, film and rock and roll. He has also edited books on experimental filmmakers Jonas Mekas, Stan Breckage, and recently in 2011, Ken Jacobs. In his 2005 book, The Most Typical Avant-Garde, he returns to the question of the relationship between alternative cinemas and the film industry. But this time, his focus is a geographical one. Los Angeles, the very center of industrial film production. The book offers a compelling survey of the complex interconnections between industrial and a broad range of non or even anti-industrial film production, amateur, experimental, documentary and others. The conflicting forces of industrial and alternative media mingle nowhere nearly as intense as in the films of Andy Warhol. It is no wonder then that David, starting with his groundbreaking chapter on the producer as, as author and allegories of cinema, has frequently returned to Warhol. In his article, The Unsecret Life, a Warhol advertisement, published in the journal October in 1991, He gives a highly instructive account of the amalgamation of art, advertising and the financial world during the Reagan era, the challenges, common categorizations of cultural production. 
His more recent research provides significant insights into Warhol's films made in Los Angeles in 1963, in particular Tarzan and Jane Regained, sort of, and Warhol's engagement with Hollywood's image production in the widest sense of the word. Personally, David, I have for a long time read your work with great interest and admiration. It has always been an inspiration for me, and I'm so happy that you're here tonight. Now we are all looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Henning. Um, I'd like to say that that was the nicest introduction I've ever had. Um, it's ex it was extremely gratifying to me, <laughs> and I'm I'm uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you so very much. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, embarrassed that I can't speak with you in German, but please uh, accept my thanks for allowing me to speak in English. You all should have a handout uh, like this. Have you all got one of these? Um, if you haven't, sounds like in school. <laughs> Raise your hand and somebody will come and bring you one, <laughs> if you want one. Okay, um, I must begin with a warning. Uh, that is, my introduction to Lupe contains spoilers. It gives away important elements in the plot. Normally, this would not be a problem with Andy Warhol's films, which do not contain a narrative arc, uh, certainly nothing like the three-act structure of the feature films with which we're, f we're familiar. Mostly, Warhol's films are narratively flat. A man eats a banana, for example, or we look at the Empire State Building for a long time. Even those films that do have narratives often seem to end suddenly and are arbitrarily, rather than reaching a significant climax or a reversal. But at the end of Lupe, something happens that comes as a total surprise and also dramatically changes everything that we've come to understand through watching the film. Now, I can't talk about the film without giving this away, and so I will not be at all distressed if you choose to leave now and not have your first experience of the film spoiled by my introduction. Okay, you're all going to stay. <laughs> okay, avant-garde films have historically had a wide spectrum of relations with the commercial film industry. At one extreme are practices that evolved entirely outside Hollywood's institutions and styles. In the United States, filmmakers including Maya Deren, Stan Brakhage, and Jonas Mekas exemplify this direction. At the other end, filmmakers whose work in, and careers involve various kinds of dialogue and other productive relations with Hollywood. Andy Warhol exemplifies this second group. He began in 1963 of a film of a man sleeping. I think it's screened in this series, right? And so perhaps you've seen it. That's one of those films that uh, endure flatly with little visual incident, in that case for more than five hours. The film posed a challenge to the viewer and a resistance to the pleasure of the commercial cinema as severe as anything by Brackage. But over the next decade, uh, for his subject matter, style, and mode of production, he gradually, though unevenly, turned toward Hollywood and toward Hollywood genres. And at last, with Heat and Flesh for Frankenstein and other features that Paul Morrissey directed for him, he became a producer of films designed to compete with Hollywood on its own terms. Lupe was made in 1965, when he was halfway through this process of changing direction. The film was scripted by a well-known playwright. It's about a Hollywood star. It was photographed in color and with sound. And especially when compared with earlier Warhol films, it is reasonably accessible and enjoyable for a member of the general public. Lupe is one of three films he made about famous Hollywood actresses, the others being his immediately previous film, a film called More Milk Yvette, about Lana Turner and her gangster lover, and the next year's film Hedy, which was about Hedy Lamarr. All three stars were renowned for their on-screen personae as highly sexualized, aggressively desiring females, 
and these personae were matched by tempestuous and often scandalous personal lives. And all three films are spiteful and vindictive, focusing on their protagonist's weaknesses and failings, and in the case of Lupe, on a wholly spurious and degrading misrepresentation of her death. Lupe depicts the last day in the life of Lupe Velez, the first Mexican actress to achieve great success in Hollywood. She began in the silent era, and in the 1920s she worked on B-movies, um, mostly screwball comedies for William Wyler, Cecil B. DeMille, and other important directors, as well as appearing in Broadway musicals. Her popularity declined somewhat after the mid-1930s, when the imposition of the production code cut into her somewhat sexy dialogue. But the box office of a film she made in 1939 crystallized her comedic talents and she became a popular icon. She became known as the Mexican Spitfire, which was the title uh, of one of the films, uh, these comic films, and she developed this character through seven more films. Here's the trailer for the film called The Mexican Spitfire, so you'll have some idea of who the film that we're about to see was based on. So that is Lupe, the person that this uh, Warhol film uh, purports to be about. Today, Lupe's broken English, her assertive sexuality, her fiery Tabasco Latin temperament, and her overall exoticism could be criticized as the exploitation of a racist stereotype. But nevertheless, her persona has been affirmed as, a, as in some sense empowering by Latina, feminist, queer critics, and artists. Vélez's tempestuous personal life included highly public affairs with Clark Gable, Charlie Chaplin, Gary Cooper, and other famous actors, and a five-year marriage to Johnny Weissmuller, Tarzan, in the mid-1930s. But in the 1944, she met a young Austrian actor, Harold Maresch, and became pregnant by him. And when he refused to marry her, she committed suicide with barbiturate pills. Her secretary found her on the morning of 14th December, lying peacefully as if in a deep sleep. But underneath her satin pillow, somewhat like the satin pillow in that bed where we saw her, were several handwritten notes, one of them reading, To Harold, may God forgive you and forgive me too, but I prefer to take my life away and our babies before I bring him into the world with shame or killing him. But by the time of Warhol's film, a very different account of her last hours had been popularized by filmmaker Kenneth Anger. Kenneth Anger wrote a book about Hollywood scandals called Hollywood Babylon, and in its first 1965 US edition, it had been recently published, and in it, he described how Velez became overwhelmed by financial and other troubles, how she decided to kill herself and determined to turn her suicide into one of those most beautiful moments of her life to turn tragedy into apotheosis. Um, I'm going to quote now from Anger's account of Velez's suicide, and that's on the handout for you, one of the things on the handout. So Lupe filled her house with flowers called in her makeup man and hairdresser, dressed herself in a lame gown, ate a last meal, and went to bed to take the barbiturates. And Kenneth Anger's account continues, Half an hour later, the meticulous staging suddenly took an unforeseen turn, which would have been worthy of Bunuel. All the effects planned by the fiery Mexican had been ordered. The flowers paid her final homage, the glistening chandeliers shone on the lame of her dress, and Lupe died in beauty. The harmony was complete, with the sole exception of the seconol and the spicy food, when the solemn lights around her body were abruptly bespattered. Lupe obeyed an instinct even stronger than death and ran, teetering on her high heels towards the bathroom but she slipped on the marble tiles as she ran up to the toilet bowl, 
which turned out to be her last mirror, and head first she fell in and broke her neck. Thus was she found, stuck and half submerged in this bowl, strange and macabre, and thus was extinguished one of Hollywood's glories. No justification for anger's fabrication exists, but it rapidly became part of Hollywood folklore, and Warhol himself knew the story. When he looked back a decade and a half after Lupe, he described the film's origin in his circle's obsession with, quote, the mystique of Hollywood, the camp of it all. And he added that they all knew the stories about Lupe, how she decided to commit the most beautiful bird of paradise suicide ever, complete with an altar and burning candles. But at the last minute, she started to vomit and died with her head wrapped round the toilet bowl. The altar and the candles may have been a projection of Warhol's own Catholicism, but the crucial toilet bowl derives from anger, and Warhol's conclusion echoed anger's sadistic glee. We all thought it was wonderful. Many of Warhol's films in this period were scripted by playwright Ronald Tavell, who invented the theatre of the ridiculous. But for Lupe, Warhol solicited another playwright, Robert Heide. He had already made a, a film version of Heide's play The Bed, and according to Heide, Warhol was fascinated by snuff films, that's films in which people actually die. And when he was informed that, uh, informed that Freddie Herco, an actor who had appeared in, her, in several of his films, had staged a performance for his friends that culminated in his committing suicide, Warhol had expressed a wish that Herco had given him advance notice so he could have filmed it. At this time, Warhol was deeply involved with the new superstar, Edie Sedgwick. She was the daughter of a scion of an extremely wealthy New England family who were cursed by a seam of mental illness, and she was herself hospitalised several times in her teens. In 1964, she moved to New York, hoping for a career in modelling, and met Warhol at a dinner party in March 1965, soon after he had turned to filmmaking full-time. Warhol was entranced with her. He invited her to the factory and immediately began to feature her in films. Sedgwick's friend, Sandy Kirkland, recalled, When Edie met Warhol, it was this immediate thing. They were going to make movies. Andy started escorting her and drew her into the fold really fast. She became this extraordinary camera object. Any time the camera was turned on, she would gravitate toward it like Gloria Swanson at the end of Sunset Boulevard. She had this real romance with it. She could be totally bedraggled, a wiped out wreck, and when the camera would go on, she would just be a magical star. It was crazy, but it was very powerful. Through most of 1965, Warhol and Sedgwick were inseparable. But by the fall, rumours of her affair with Bob Dylan were straining their relationship, and Warhol asked Heidi to write a screenplay in which she would commit suicide. Heidi was a friend of Kenneth Anger, he knew Hollywood Babylon, and he had the idea of using Anger's account of Lupe's death as the vehicle for a suicide narrative for Edie. Anger did not like Warhol, but he didn't object to Heidi's plan, and so Heidi wrote a screenplay called The Death of Lupi Velez and gave copies to both Warhol and Sedgwick. Sometime later, uh, Heidi arranged to discuss the project with him, but when he met Edie, who was in Dylan's company at that time, at a bar in Greenwich Village, she told him that they had filmed it already the previous night. The film begins by following Heidi's script. It opens with Lupe curled up in bed wearing negligee, but after that, few traces of the script recur. This was common practice for Warhol, to commission a screenplay, but then to impede its usage by, for example, not letting the actors see it until just before shooting. <laughs> 
But for Edie, it didn't make much difference because in any case, she was usually too stoned to memorize her lines. Nevertheless, it is clear that the motive for Lupe was Warhol's desire to film Sedgwick's suicide. The account of Velez's death that Heidi took from Anger's book simply provided the dramatic frame in which it could be improvised. On the evening Sedgwick mentioned in December 1965, she, Warhol and several others went to an apartment belonging to a prominent hostess at the Gota building at 76, uh, 72nd Street and Central Park West. That is the apartment building in which John Lennon was living uh, when he was murdered outside it 15 years later. Warhol photographed the film himself using his Oricon camera, one that during shooting recorded sound directly onto the film on an optical track. Uh, problems with the processing of this film uh, resulted in the soundtrack being very, very poor. And when you hear, or when you watch it, you will hear continuous buzzing all the way through, and only occasionally will you be able to make out fragments of dialogue. This is not the projectionist's fault. Uh, the projectionists have been very good, but it is a property of the film itself, not of the projection apparatus here. Warhol photographed three 1,200-foot reels of 16mm ectochrome of Sedgwick ostensibly playing Velez on the last day of her life. And to each reel of 1,200-foot takes, he affixed a 100-foot roll of her lying on the floor with her head in the toilet. Lupe, as it was released, comprised of two of these reels. The third reel was screened once, but has not been screened since, and has not been restored. Since you're going to see it, I'm not going to describe the film anymore, but I've already given away the most important fact, the two 100-foot reels of Lupe dead that ends the continuous 1,200-foot takes of her last morning and her last evening. Until Warhol withdrew his films from circulation in 1970, Lupe was distributed with instructions that it could be pr projected as a single-screen 72-minute film or as a 36-minute twin-screen film with reel 1, the morning, on the left and reel 2, the evening, on the right. We are not going to screen the two-screen version, but just to remind you what it looks like, here's a few minutes of a, very, a film that in this respect is very similar. This is inner and outer space, which again features Edie in two screens, uh, each facing the other. Uh, could you screen the fragment from inner and outer space, please? So we're going to screen just one of those, and so perhaps you'll um, um, begin to imagine how it would look if both of our screens uh, were situated on the screen at the same time, uh, side by side. Okay, when his relationship with Edie was at its height, Warhol expressed a radical cinematic desire. Quote, I, and this is also on the handout, I always wanted to do a movie of a whole day in Edie's life, he began. Then he elaborated on his dislike of selective editing, of, quote, picking out certain scenes and pieces of time and putting them together, because then it ends up being different from what really happened. It's just not like life. It seems so corny. He explained that his ideal was a film with no editing and no rehearsal. I only wanted to find great people and let them be themselves and talk about what they usually talked about and I filmed them for a certain length of time and that would be the movie. This sounds very radical, but the aspiration was not totally unique. The prizing of unedited documentary realism recalls especially Cesar Zavattini, a theorist and screenwriter of Italian neorealism who once said, the ideal film would be 90 minutes of the life of a man to whom nothing happens. 
and it also, and more immediately, uh, resembles the then innovative observational principles of Ricky Leacock and the contemporary US cinema verite, or direct cinema. And this uh, urge towards unmediated realism uh, is reflected in many elements of Warhol's actual filmmaking up to this point. The basic situation at the core of each of the 472 screen tests, for example, where Warhol invited a subject simply to be himself or herself in the most fundamental cinematic situation, alone in front of a 60mm camera for a 100-foot roll of film. But even when Warhol's filmmaking appears to resemble the non-interventionist, voyeuristic recording of an innocent and unknown subject, simply being themselves, in practice it was also inhabited by the opposite, the implication that the self was unstable, elusive and constructed, rather than authentic and integral. This other idea of the self as performance was quite common at the time and had in fact been expressed in a very famous essay published the year before by Susan Sontag in which she wrote, quote, to perceive camp in objects and persons is to understand being as playing a role. It is the farthest extension in sensibility of the metaphor of life as theatre. And you remember that Warhol's statement that he'd been interested in the mystique of Hollywood, the camp of it all. Warhol's cinema implies two major registers in which this imaginary self-construction is staged. First, immediate self-dramatization in the medium of film and second, imaginary self-dramatization in the media system as a whole, for which the movie camera functions as a metonym. Though the screen tests may parody the real Hollywood screen tests, nevertheless they always contain the implication that, if you were successful, if the camera liked you, you might be admitted to prominence in Warhol's parody of the studio system and that contained the possibility of migrating beyond it and into the public media system as a whole, as indeed happened in some way to some of the superstars. For Warhol's own obsession with media icons who are enshrined in a halo of glamour and celebrity is matched by its utopian inverse the possibility that any member of the general public might gain access to this system. In the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Since anyone who hopes to be famous, if only for 15 minutes, must negotiate a public identity, a number of Warhol's films revolve around the fabrication and erosion of personal identity in a media-saturated environment where the possibility of an autonomous selfhood has become remote. As I said, in these contexts, the self is not an intrinsic stable reality, but rather a role that was provisional, performed rather than revealed. It could only be improvised within the mirror of the filmmaking apparatus, in the mirror provided by the context of the people surrounding the filming, and by implication within the mirror of the attention of the media apparatus as a whole. To intensify this instability in the self, in his filmmaking outside the screen tests, Warhol took pains to make the process of filmmaking sure that it constantly intruded upon and interrupted the performance of the self. The scenarios he set in play in longer films, even in scripted narratives that appeared to offer the refuge of a consistent assumed role, often sacrificed transparent illusionist realism for reflexive interruptions that asserted the presence of the camera and the other mem elements of the filmmaking process for example by having crew members make hostile comments from off-screen, 
or otherwise interfere with the drama to precipitate incidents that would catch the performers off guard. These maximized the subject's awareness of the camera and of the social situation of filmmaking, and so impeded their self-construction, especially to provoke crises that would break the facade of everyday self-presentation and create spontaneous dramas in which the performers made unexpected revelations. If we transpose it to the register of style, this anti-realist aesthetic had its basis in the uninflected stare of the camera, but in Warhol's quasi-narrative films, that stare was interrupted by a spectrum of improper and ungrammatical effects in the photography. These included failure to focus the camera, inadequate lighting, arbitrary zooms and pans, and the exclusion of editing. Rather than making a transparent representation, these ruptured made the, ruptures made the process of perception uh, an aesthetic activity itself, one that had to be prolonged. These technical irregularities may have originated in accidents caused by Warhol's initial unfamiliarity with film technology, but even when he became proficient, he continued to cultivate deliberate infractions of standard film style that assault the protagonist with willful filmic incompetence. All these issues about celebrity and the performance of self were brought to the foreground at just this time by Warhol's own growing notoriety and his abandonment of silk screening for filmmaking and the engagement with Hollywood that it seemed to make possible. During the first part of 1965, when Warhol was involved with Sedgwick, both of them emerged into an unprecedented celebrity and the two used each other to promote their fame. Early in 1965, Warhol, Sedgwick and the Superstars had been featured in prominent stories in the national press, including spreads in Life magazine and the New York Times. But it was the occasion of his first museum show at the Philadelphia Institute of Contemporary Art that for the first time Warhol experienced the frenzy of recognition as if he himself had at last become a star. On October the 8th, 1965, two months before Lupe was shot, on the opening night of that show, the museum was taken over by a huge crowd of rowdy kids, estimated by Warhol to number 4,000, all chanting, Edie and Andy, Edie and Andy. The museum staff were afraid that the crowds would damage the art and removed it from the walls, with the result that, in Warhol's own words, we weren't just at the art exhibit, we were the art exhibit. We were the art incarnate. The same month as this show, they appeared together on national television on the Merv Griffin Show, where the host introduced them as the two leading exponents of the new scene. Warhol was clear, Sedgwick was more, clearly much more comfortable with media attention, and Warhol tended to speak through her. Uh, here's a clip of Edie and Andy on the Merv Griffin Show in uh, 1965. So great that the, that the move to Hollywood had appeared to be quite a real possibility for both of them. But only two months later, with Edie romantically involved with Bob Dylan and with Dylan's manager, Albert Grossman, expressing an interest in taking her on as a client, their relationship was strained. She was angry that he wouldn't pay her for work and he felt himself abandoned. And in Lupe, he imagined her, her as a Hollywood star, but subjected her to a cruelly punitive death. By the time of Lupe, as well as being in nine screen tests, Sedgwick had appeared in more than a dozen films in 1965, 
starring in, among others, Poor Little Rich Girl and Inner and Outer Space. The title, Poor Little Rich Girl, invokes a 1936 film of the same name, starring Shirley Temple as a rich girl who leaves her family and becomes a radio star, precisely paralleling the itinerary that Warhol hoped for Edie. And, as we have seen, Outer and Inner Space anticipated the uh, twin screen uh, that was envisaged for Lupe. So, Lupe is a brief version of the ideal of a movie about a whole day in, the, a whole day in Edie's life. But he intervened in that documentary realism by projecting on Edie the role of Lupe Velez and projecting on both Kenneth Anger's vicious and degrading account of her death. The result was precisely that picking out of certain scenes and pieces of time and putting them back together that he had claimed to deplore. And the death scenes are especially sensationalist uh, dramatic eruption, almost unique in Warhol's films. And the narrative closure of her death imposes its shape on his usual uninflected temporal evenness. But on the other hand, the combination of technical competence and restraint allows the portrait to be relatively conventionally aestheticized and relatively unchallenging. Warhol shot it in a well-appointed apartment with proper lighting and the camera is in focus throughout with the tripod mounting allowing him to zoom and pan smoothly. And the only assaultive technical irregularity is the very poor sound quality. In all these respects, it radically differs from its two companion pieces, More Milky Vet and Hedy, which are bad in every respect, and that bad filmic quality reenacts the violence inflicted on their heroines. These two factors, the skeletal framework of a dramatic persona and a relatively transparent, unhindered style of filmmaking, allow the themes, thematic elements to emerge clearly. The private filmic event and the mass media resonances that it implies creates a hall of mirrors. The role of Lupe becomes a reflective frame of implications containing Sedgwick's everyday self-construction, shaping her performance of an identity in the medium of film and its reverberations in cinema history. And as Warhol observed Sedgwick in her world of mirrors, he must have found himself reflected back from her. As you watch the film, perhaps be aware of the role played by actual mirrors, and especially the difference between the first reel, which is dominated by a mirror, and the second reel where there is a mirror, but it's not used, so Edie constructs herself more clearly in her role as Velez. Though Edie does not actually die in the long take, she appears to be at the end edge of her tether, as if she were actually on the verge of one of the many nervous breakdowns that had institutionalized her. Performing Lupe in extremis, she is also performing herself in extremis. And as the perforations at the end of the reel of the performances meet the per perforations at the attached 100-foot reel that depicts her death, she reappears on the f toilet floor with her head in what Kenneth Anger had termed her last mirror. But still, the film provides yet another mirror. Occupying the bathroom door, it doubles the image of her body, just as the wall, mi wall mirror does uh, in the first reel. A similar kind of anticipation positions the film in her life. Though neither Warhol nor Grossman actually made her a Hollywood star, Half a decade after Lupe, Edie did star in a semi-autobiographical, theatrically released exploitation feature called Chow Manhattan. In it, she essentially played herself as Susan Superstar, returning to the California nursing homes and reckless promiscuity.
a mentally ill drug addict, she played a mentally ill drug addict. And then three months after finishing it, she died of what the Santa Barbara coroner described as acute barbiturate poisoning. Unlike Velez, like Velez, Sedgwick became a celebrity by playing herself, and her role of, as Velez was the apotheosis of her life and art, and in both she was a film star who died from self-administered drugs. Both Edie and Lamar were actors, players who held a mirror up to nature, but the nature they mirrored was their own self-construction and ultimately their self-destruction. There's no evidence to suggest that Warhol's interest in Velez, specifically, was fueled by anything other than Anger's account of her death. Nevertheless, one can conjecture that his personal involvement in Edie and in Edie as Velez reflected some deep, if oblique, personal psychic investment that makes the mirrorings in the film also resonate in the events behind it. In filming Sedgwick, Warhol was in some sense filming himself or an ideal version of himself. When they were most closely identified, Warhol and Sedgwick emphasized their visual resemblance, dressing in similar clothes, for example, and she spraying her hair silver to match his wig. A comment by poet Rene Picard pinpoints the fantasy projection of him into her. In this period, he wrote, Edie was pasted up to look just like him, but looking so good. And it is supported by Truman Capote's observation. I think Edie was something Andy would like to have been. He was transposing himself onto her like Pygmalion. Andy Warhol would like to have been Edie Sedgwick. He would have liked to have been a charming, well-born debutante from Boston. When Warhol staged Velez's death, it was not in her fake Mexican hacienda, but in the apartment of a wealthy, well-born woman. And we wonder, did he mobilize her there as his ideal self? And did he then dramatize his anxiety about losing her by brutally killing her, leaving her corpse to observe itself in its last mirror? One can't help recalling his sardonic remark on Velez's death. We thought it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much, David James. And, um, yeah, wie gesagt, jetzt 10 Minuten Umbaupause. Sie können noch mal rausgehen. Um, das Café hat auch noch offen. Durch den Gong werden wir signalisieren, wenn es weitergeht. Bis gleich. If there are any questions, just give me a sign and I will come to you. Winfried, hattest du eine Frage oder? 